In New Zealand, supplement use is high, we know that, as in we've got adolescents that use it to a really high degree. It's normalised in our society, it's part of sport, and unfortunately, not all athletes are adhering to uh, the guidelines that we've got in place. We realised we really had to change what we did and what we said. We used to tell people just don't use supplements, um, and we realised that that was really impractical. The Athlete Voice is one of the best tools that you can have in an education program. Supplement use is still a huge issue in the United States and we have cases every year that are related to supplement use and contamination. Just explaining what athletes actually go through to give a different side or a different way of thinking so that when education is actually put through, it can be navigated or explained in that way that we can understand. If we can get people like Cassie over to New Zealand to come and talk to the athletes directly, they will relate to her quite differently and I think we can make fundamental change with people like her. Welcome to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Onside, the official podcast for Sport Integrity Australia. I'm Tim Gavel. Our podcast explores the integrity issues in sport, the challenges sports face and highlights the achievements within the industry. The Minister for Sport, Annika Wells, recently announced that Sport Integrity Australia will extend its capabilities to include a safety in sport division, bring together all aspects of the national integrity framework. This will ensure Sport Integrity Australia can assist sports and athletes with the delivery of the framework, inform education programs and enhance the current integrity management program that already exists. The announcement also includes a confidential reporting scheme from January 2023 to ensure athletes have a safe place to tell their story where they'll receive appropriate wellbeing support and be guided on how to achieve an outcome for their issue. Currently, 77 sports have adopted the National Integrity Framework with an additional eight sports in the process of doing so. While 12 sports are working towards having Sport Integrity Australia approved policies in place. In other news, for the first time in over a decade in Australia in the 2021-22 financial year, not a single athlete tested positive to a doping test due to a supplement. Sport Integrity Australia's long-standing advice to athletes has been that no supplement is safe to use as they pose too much of a risk to an athlete's health, career and reputation. But despite this warning, between 2016 and 2019, a third of positive doping tests were due to supplements. In this episode of On Site, we'll discuss the dangers of supplements and the importance of education in anti-doping with a panel of members well-versed in this area, brought together at the World Anti-Doping Agency's Global Education Conference held in Sydney this year. We'll be speaking with Sport Integrity Australia Athlete Advisory Group member Cassie Fian, was sanctioned for inadvertent supplement use. Drug Free Sport New Zealand's General Manager Athlete Services, Dr. Sean Clancy. Alexis Cooper, the Director of Education and Innovation at Sport Integrity Australia. And Kelsa Ferguson, Health Professional Educator Specialist at the US Anti-Doping Agency. And later in the program, we'll also talk to the CEO of Drug Free Sport New Zealand, Nick Patterson, about his view on education, anti-doping globally, and the recent announcement that New Zealand will be combining all of its sport integrity jurisdictions under one roof, similar to Sport Integrity Australia's model. Firstly, to you, Cassie, as part of the Athlete Advisory Group, a sanctioned athlete, uh, firstly, I guess you've gone through a fair process now, haven't you, uh, since it all happened a number of years ago. Do you feel as though it's quite cathartic to, to be talking about it uh, at an education conference? Uh, absolutely, yeah. It is good to know that um, something that was so horrible to go through um, is actually helping others um, in the long term. In what way do you think you can help others? I think from an athlete perspective, I know when I've done the training, um, the a training about anti-doping, is it wasn't relatable. Uh, now it is because it actually grabs the attention that an athlete has gone through it and even an athlete that is 
quite normal. It's I'm not a high class, you know, elite athlete that's you know getting paid millions of dollars and have everything um, sorted out. I'm just a, a normal person trying to pursue a passion, and um, that you know supplements are something that it could happen to anyone, and that really does grab the attention of athletes that are going through maybe similar things. As we move along the panel, firstly, uh, I just want to ask you. Um, in terms of educating athletes in their own language, is that something you've been able to contribute as part of the Athlete Advisory Group? I hope so. <laughs> um, and yes, we are. I think uh, bringing a different perspective or even just um, a different way of thinking or what or just explaining what athletes actually go through um, to give a different side or a different um, a way of thinking so that when an ad education is actually put through, um, it can be uh, navigated or uh, explained in that way that we can understand. All right, we'll talk about the mental health aspect in just a moment too, because that's a very important part of it. Um, Shana, as the General Manager, Athlete Services, Drug Free Sport New Zealand, can you tell us your perspective on, on supplements and also Cassie's story, how did it resonate with you? Yeah, well, firstly, I thought that story was really powerful uh, and just picking up on Cassie's point around um, contextual relevance, that's something that we do at Drug Free Sport as well, we'll try to do through our athlete educators, uh, is really hone in on all of our messaging, uh, but particularly around supplements, just when they bring it to the fore of the athletes uh, and talking about their personal experiences, we use a storytelling approach a lot. And so I think what I saw yesterday, or sorry, Tuesday from uh, Cassie's example uh, really resonated with how we're doing it there and it gave me the feeling that we're on the right track as well because it, that approach hit home with everyone who is here uh, and I really think resonates with athletes as well um, in the same way when we do it in New Zealand too. How big a problem is it in New Zealand? So I think I look at problem maybe my perspective on the problem is, in, is twofold. One is what we know through anti-doping like metrics so in terms of positive, positive test results uh, it's one way to measure the problem, but I think the, my perspective on it is around the prevalence of supplement use, so the, the level of risk that there is whether or not athletes are tested. So in New Zealand, supplement use is high, we know that, um, as in we've got adolescents that use it to a really high degree, it's normalised in our society, it's part of sport, uh, and unfortunately uh, not all athletes are adhering to uh, the guidelines that we've got in place and using the educational tools um, to navigate that as best they can. So that's what we're really focusing on is understanding the, I guess, the normalisation of this, um, the prevalence of supplement use and trying as best we can to provide those tools to athletes so that they can navigate what is a really complex environment. So what have you learnt, do you think, uh, during this conference? What have you learnt about education? I think uh, this conference has really reinforced a couple of uh, key things for me. Probably one of them is around the athlete pathway. Uh, so the importance of addressing uh, some of these social norms uh, and behaviours early. Um, that's something that we know to be true and we've been trying to do that in New Zealand for some time now. Um, we've recently uh, established a youth education program uh, and one thing I've learned in here uh, in this conference is really how can we um, better tailor the messages that we're giving at a developmentally appropriate level and way, so right the way through the the pathway. So just because an athlete's reached the international level, it doesn't mean that they're not vulnerable. Um, equally, a youth athlete, they're, they're equally as vulnerable in different ways. Uh, and it's just that that will change throughout the pathway. Uh, and that's something that we need to be really aware of as we create content and as we deliver content. Lex Cooper is also here. Lex is the Director of Education at Sport Integrity Australia. And Lex, I guess a very important milestone for Sport Integrity Australia with zero positives for the 12th month period, 2021-2022. But it was a, a holistic approach. I mean, it wasn't just Sport Integrity Australia. Can you tell us the approach that you've taken over the last five years to get to this point? Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a really long journey and we've worked really, really hard. So we're delighted by the um, outcome from the last year. But uh, it all started back in 2016, 2017. Uh, we had 17 athletes test positive from a supplement, um, which is heartbreaking. These are cases just like Cassie's. They're real people. They're going through um, immense toll on their mental health. They're you know, not able to participate in the sports that they love. Um, and we realised we really had to change what we did and what we said. Um, so the first thing 
that we did really was change our messaging. We used to tell people just don't use supplements. Um, and we realized that that was really impractical, to be honest. Um, athletes we know are exposed to supplements. We know that some dietitians and nutritionists are telling them to take supplements. Um, and some of them are just doing it of their own accord. So um, we changed it to, we recommend food first, but if you have to take a supplement, um, then you should be using a batch tested one. That's really the only option as an athlete. Um, and then we took the next step of creating the Sport Integrity app, which included a list of batch tested supplements sold in Australia um, to make it easy for athletes to actually do that check. Uh, and then we followed that up with tons of great, you know, social media and comms. Um, and I think the kicker came when we were able to have a partnership with TGA um, and for Sands to talk about the regulation of supplements in Australia and actually get some meaningful change um, in the way that they're regulated to make the entire environment a bit safer. So um, a mammoth effort um, on multiple fronts in the agency. You mentioned the, the language of the education process. Uh, can you give us an example of how you've been able to penetrate? Because I'm sure over the years you've done a lot of education, but it may not have got through to the athlete. So I guess in the past we used to use doctors, for example, to say don't use supplements. Um, and the messaging changed. We started moving to athletes who were using them um, and who had experiences like Cassie. So um, working with Cassie to get her voice into athletes was probably the biggest change that we did so that athletes could hear from athletes um, about their experiences when it goes wrong, but also to hear from elite athletes who are using supplements and doing everything they can to try to stay safe um, so that we knew kind of, you know, what could go wrong and how you could try to protect yourself if you did go down that path. So how important was it to have somebody like Cassie giving that message? Uh, because you mentioned there that um, peer to peer yeah. and a sanctioned athlete talking about it is so powerful. It's, I, I can't understate, no, I can't overstate <laughs> the impact that Cassie has had on our education program. Um, having her give us her advice and her experience is one thing, but then to take the next step and actually work with us to talk directly to athletes um, is so courageous and so brave and has, I know, changed athletes' lives in our entire education program. It's great. We'll, we'll come back and we'll have a chat about, um, you know, the role that you've played, Cassie, in just a moment and talk about mental health, etc. We'll go now to Kelsa Ferguson from USADA. Kelsa, can you tell us about the, the issue in, in the US? Obviously a far wider uh, remit over there, bigger audience um, that you've got to cater to. How do you get the message out to so many people? Absolutely. Supplement use is still a huge issue in the United States and we have um, cases every year that are related to supplement use and contamination. So supplement risk are a huge part of our athlete education. We include that in all of our presentations, and it's one of the biggest part of our presentations is talking about the risk of supplements for athletes. We also have a ton of resources that we use online. We have a whole Supplement Connect web, web page for people to go to um, and to research supplements and learn more about them. We also have a high risk list. Um, we don't have an app like Australia does. That sounds wonderful, but we have a high risk list where athletes can go and see what supplements are at high risk that have been tested and shown in the United States to possibly be contaminated and be a risk to athletes. And that's currently being updated and is going live at the end of September. And along with that, we also have an athlete like Cassie, who's very similar. She's one of our athlete ambassadors who was sanctioned at a very young age for supplement contamination and supplement use. And we use her story in our education. And she also goes out, she's part of our True Sport program and talks to youth about the risk of supplements and what she went through and her mental health issues as well. And that's been a big benefit for us. You've got quite a unique role, haven't you, as a medical professional educator, um, which is a little outside the box, I guess, in that you're educating doctors and medical professionals, dietitians, et cetera, uh, about supplements, for instance. How does that work in the US? I think it's really close to the same way that we educate the athletes. I think there's the same level of education. There are many uh, health professionals out there and doctors that also aren't aware of the risks and they're recommending supplement use to athletes. And it's important for us to educate them the same way that we educate athletes on here are the risks, here where you can go and check and here's what you should be telling athletes because we know they're a very trusted resource to athletes. And I spoke about a case yesterday where 
a uh, physician assistant actually recommended and said that a supplement was okay to use for the athlete, and the athlete ended up receiving a sanction because it contained a prohibited substance, and they thought it was okay because their physician assistant said that it was when they were unaware of the risks. Does it surprise you that there is that lack of education amongst medical professionals? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not a big thing that's educated that I've seen anywhere around the United States that many people just aren't aware that supplements aren't regulated and they don't know when you go and talk to your doctors and the medical team that you trust and they don't know either. And it's um, we try to talk to our athletes about how we can explain that to them when they go and talk to their medical professionals that it is an issue and that they need to talk about it as a team. Can you tell us about the Health Pro Advantage and what that does in terms of educating medical professionals? Absolutely. So the Health Pro Advantage is our online course. Um, we do it in partnership with Stanford University, which is great because they accredit the course for us. So uh, participants can get continuing education credits for completing it. And a huge part of that course is also supplement education and teaching them what to look for in supplements um, and how to talk to their athletes about supplement use, because I think that's a big part too, uh, that health professionals, um, they work with their athletes, they see the medications that they're taking, they see the supplements that they're taking, um, and they could be a really good resource to talk to them about the risks because athletes trust them. So if we can educate health professionals to uh, better communicate with athletes on the risk of supplements, they may listen to them as well. So, Cassie, I guess you, you've heard a lot over the last couple of days. Uh, it resonates with you, no doubt. Uh, does it trigger memories of dark times, you know, the mental health issues that you faced after testing positive and just working out where you've positioned yourself in life, not only running but, but in life itself? Oh, without a doubt. Um, I still to this day, to be uh, brutally honest, is still suffer from uh, mental health issues um, uh, that's generated from that. It's a, a very complex complex case and I'm still in therapy this day. Um, that's, you know, pretty raw and, and out there, but it's, it's the truth. So, um, and like I said in my video, uh, you know, I do hope one day that it's just you know, a part of my life, but it's just, it's always going to be there. Right. Um, and yeah, so, but it, it has come a long way. I think the first time I went back into competition, um, I suffered a quite a bad panic attack. We're actually right in the middle of Darling Harbour. Um, yeah, uncontrollable. Uh, so I've come a little bit away since there, but um, yeah, I don't think that uh, it's it's ever going to completely go away, but the mental health struggles is real. Um, and, you know, I did have a choice to, you know, just go and hide away and, and never go back to my sport, but um, that that wasn't an option for me in the sense of um, it's, it's a part of my identity, it's a part of my purpose in life, and, and it's what brings me so much joy um, and also I, I knew that I didn't have anything to be ashamed of in a sense that I did do everything I possibly could um, to try to safeguard myself um, and my situation I still take responsibility for it in the sense of my maybe naivety or being not as educated as I, I needed to be so I'm not there's no blame or anything associated with it um, but still in, in the same sense, um, yeah, it, it, it still is a bit, of a bit of a struggle. Now, five years on, I'm going to open it up to the panel to talk about uh, the most effective ways of education that you've come across and you might have learned something over the last couple of days that you hadn't thought of as well. But firstly to you, Cassie, what is the most effective way that you have now experienced five years later of getting the message across? What, what's, what's the best way? So for me and the feedback I've received from my video from actually, from athletes reaching out for me um, because it is a part of their education um, that they have to do now uh, and simply people have said I went home and threw all my supplements away um, or I can't, that I've never realised that, I didn't understand that, I didn't and yet these athletes have been doing education for years and years and years and they've seen all they've seen all the messaging these yeah but I guess for me um, again maybe it's back down to naivety when I purchased the supplement from a local nutrition like a nutrition store in Australia you don't even think you, you're taking it off the shelf you're like there can't be anything illegal in something that I'm buying or purchasing from a store in Australia, in my country. Um, and But now, I guess, with what I went through and actually showing that, hey, 
yeah, it can happen and it has massive effects, uh, a massive ripple um, on your professional um, career, uh, family career, everything. Uh, it, it really does send a message and I've seen it firsthand that it does work. It's that message that it is available on the shelves in supermarkets and you walk past it every day resonates with a lot of people in this room. I'll open it up now to everybody here, to, to Kelsey, Lex and Sean, just on the best ways that you think of, you can educate athletes about supplement use, but also something you might have learnt over the last couple of days through the education conference. So over to you, Sean. Uh, yeah, one thing that I'll just touch on again, it's linked pretty strongly to uh, Cassie's story, which I think just amplifies how good it is, how, how important it is to include real life stories in our content. Um, is actually merging that with evidence. So uh, we've done that pretty strongly uh, in New Zealand. Uh, but a really key or two key parts of that I'll just touch on. So one is athlete identity and the other would be um, cultural sensitivity or uh, cultural specificity in our, in our content. So uh, athlete identity, we know uh, from the social science research that's available that uh, a multidimensional athlete identity is really important. So when athletes have you know, not just one sole focus being sport, but they actually see themselves, you know, as, as a, a family member, as a professional, as a athlete, as a, you know, sister or a daughter or, or whatever. So the athlete identity part is huge. And in research that we've done with adolescents, particularly in New Zealand, we realised that the stronger people became solely focused or their identity was just wrapped up in their sport, particularly through social media, they were bombarded with supplement advertising. Um, obviously the algorithms that they're connected to through everything they like, which is athletic of some kind or liking sport related imagery. Uh, it just meant that they were bombarded more with the supplement messaging and the two started to come together. So the more you identified as an athlete and less about other things, the more you saw supplement marketing. So that is a real challenge. Uh, and I just think how we've kind of worked through this conference touching on athlete identity and kind of identifying that that's a really important part that educators need to be aware of is talking about athlete identity as part of our education and how that links with supplement use or you know potentially doping as well um so that's one key thing athlete identity and the other thing um is i have noticed through this conference it's not necessarily been something that's been overtly part of the content but is that we all have a different way of achieving what we do. So our education content by country or by IF is very, we've obviously got requirements we have to meet by the IEC, um, but we're all doing it in our own way, which is specific to our country and it's got our own flavour, uh, which is really important to hold on to, I think, for our athletes. So, you know, in New Zealand, we'll have a key message which we'll deliver in our way, which meets the needs of our athletes and they resonate with. In Australia, it'll be different. In America, it'll be different again. Uh, and I think it's just really important that we keep that national flavour so that we're always hitting home with our athletes because uh, it creates that relevance for them. Yeah, I think um, the athlete voice is one of the best tools that you can have in an education program, whether that's um, stories like Cassie's or just having athletes speaking to athletes. They're more likely to respond and listen to people who have the same experience and are living the same sorts of lifestyles and challenges that they are. Um, I think in terms of what we've learned, I've loved the focus through the conference on moving beyond just giving athletes information and actually moving to developing the behaviours that they need to keep themselves um, protected once they're out of an education session. So instead of education being here, have a bunch of information about anti-doping rules or whatever, it becomes, hi, we're going to teach you, um, you know, certain behaviours and give you tools to be able to do things that you're actually going to be able to use um, once you leave this session. So that might be, you know, teaching them behaviour of how to check a supplement, how to check a medication, but it can also be things like how to advocate for clean sport to influence younger generations. It can be during a test, how do you stand up for yourself if something isn't going right? How do you exercise your rights? Um, all sorts of great things that I think will really transform education moving forward from being information into actually behaviour focused. And I guess in, in Australia, uh you do a lot of face-to-face uh, -face sessions as well, don't you? So it's not just online. Oh, but absolutely. It, it's very much uh, in the face of the athletes with athletes speaking to, to other athletes. Yeah, it is. So we use um, 
only really athlete educators. Uh, we moved away from using testing staff or people like me uh, into using athletes that have that experience. And um, the face-to-face -face response that we've received from athletes has been overwhelming. Um, generally, everyone's in there having a good time, um, both the presenters and the athletes. So, Absolutely. And I would agree with what everyone has said already. The athlete voice is so important. Um, it's very relatable, which we've discovered and talked about during this conference, that that's important, that it's relatable to the athletes. And so we have athlete presenters and athlete ambassadors in the United States that we use for that. Um, as far as what I do with health professionals, I know in our online programs, we've been using a lot of case studies, which is kind of a good way to communicate with health professionals. It's something that they're familiar with looking at and going through. So I use that a lot in my um, education for health professionals. And I think over the past few days of the conference, what I've learned a lot about, I really appreciated the athlete pathway and kind of knowing your audience and creating an education plan specific for your area, for the age, for the type of athletes that you're working with. I think that's really important to uh, use for each education session to find a way to relate to that audience and make a plan just for them and actions that they can do at their age or their level. The challenges continue, don't they? Because you've got, you're up against powerful forces, obviously, with supplement com companies obviously looking to to push their wares. Um, so, you know, it, it's by no stretch of the imagination. You can, you can be comfortable. 100%. Um, I guess to add to that, we, you know, yes, we had no athletes test positive in the last financial year, but, um, you know, it's not going to stay that way. We have to have vigilance. Athletes have to keep checking their supplements. We have to keep trying to work with our partners um, or it can just as easily get back up to the numbers that we had. You know, it, this isn't a time to be um, relaxed. Um, I, I just really want to emphasize that we have to stay vigilant. Yeah, and I'll just add to that from a, uh, how we can include that vigilance or keep equipping athletes with those tools to help them be vigilant. Um, one thing we haven't touched on too much in this conference, but we are doing in New Zealand at the moment is around media literacy. So for our athletes, we're actually giving them the tools that they require to be really critical about what they are hearing and seeing. Um, when they're seeing images, um, are they questioning if it's been photoshopped? Are they questioning if the evidence is validated that they think, you know, when they're conducting research on a supplement, how do they know that that research, the evidence that's there is factual? Uh, so we're providing those tools to help athletes navigate some of the stuff that they see and hear rather than accepting it as true, giving them those critical thinking skills. I guess when you have a look at some of the social media platforms um, now, it, the image that people are presenting is so important. Supplements play a role there too, don't they? Yeah, they do. And uh, the research we conducted in New Zealand found that really that hit home around the age of 15, uh, where that imagery and social media and marketing campaigns in various formats uh, was really starting to impact behaviour and decision making. Uh, yeah, so the more, uh, as I said, the more they, the more that athletes uh, identify themselves as that, as an athlete, the more they're exposed to and without the critical thinking skills to question what they're seeing or hearing or believing, um, they're in a really compromising situation and they're quite vulnerable. So that's where we're trying to target with the right tools at the right time uh, based on what we know they're exposed to. And just as a final question, you all feel inspired after listening to everybody else over the the days of the conference and think, right, I can't wait to get, get started, get back to where um, I work and uh, implement some of the things that I've heard over the last four days. I'm personally really excited to see what our team takes back and how we can change our education plan to make it uh, more effective to really teach new behaviours and really put, as the conference's education in action and see what we can do in the future to uh, improve our education, especially today on Innovation Day, seeing all the virtual reality and all the things that everyone across the world is doing in their education. And I'm excited to see what we can do with that in the future as well. 100%. My list of ideas and things I want to do is humongous. Uh, I feel for the team when we get back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just doubling down on that. Um, I think to the opportunities for collaboration, one thing we've identified or I've identified here is that Different countries are doing different things and, you know, some have had the resource to put quite a bit behind the idea they've got. 
uh, where we can't all have the resource to have all the ideas and do all the things, but what we can do is identify who's doing what and seek to collaborate. Um, for example, in New Zealand, we might not have um, a, a Cassie who's happy to uh, share her story. Um, so how can we collaborate in a way that brings that story to our athletes because it's so valuable? But vice versa, we might have something that could assist other countries and we're happy to share that. So I think um, that's a really exciting part of these opportunities, particularly face-to-face, -face. Yeah, build that relationship, uh, which hopefully we can take home and start the sharing. Speaking of, I just want to take your media literacy, FYI. It's yours. <laughs> Cassie, you're keen to keep up the fight, aren't you? you... Uh, without a doubt. And I think um, it's a testament to um, Sport Integrity Australia to, yes, I had a story, but they were also that willing to facilitate to put my story out there as well. So I think it definitely is a team approach and, and that's the other side that we have to come from it. We're not, you know athletes and these agencies we shouldn't be butting heads we should be working together because at the end of the day we all want the same thing and we want our sport to be clean so yeah good on you cassie thanks very much sean also uh, lex and kelso thanks very much for joining us on this podcast thank you you're listening to onside the official podcast of sport integrity australia Welcome back to Onside. We've been joined now by Nick Patterson, the CEO of Drug Free Sport New Zealand. Uh, and Nick, uh, looking at Australia and New Zealand in terms of anti-doping, uh, are the issues similar? Um, undoubtedly. We share so much sporting history and, in fact, sporting stars. Um, if we look at the professional leagues, and we've got a rugby league side in your in your, in your your um, league, um, it's the same with soccer, it's the same with and obviously the rugby we play against each other. So the cross has been nature of society, but particularly sport, undoubtedly it's the same issues on both sides. So do you feel as though you can work together? Is that the way that collaboration works here? Oh, look, the collaboration cross Tasman between Drug Free Sport New Zealand and Sport Integrity Australia is just enormously strong. We are sharing information, people, resources um, at all levels, um, and that can only be to the benefit of the athletes. And this is what it's all about. If I don't have to spend some money to develop something, because you guys in Australia have already developed it, and I can spend that money on something else. And in turn, I'll share that with you. But let's not double up on our expenses. Let's share the money, share the expenses, and then share the results. Oceania is quite a big region too. I would imagine that you know, with Australia and New Zealand being at the forefront, you're able to help other countries around Australia and New Zealand in the Oceania region get up to scratch and we certainly try to um oceania the pacific region as as, as we'll know is, is enormous we've got um island groups from the north pacific all the way down through to the um south and the long way long way out west now, there's an oceania regional anti-doping organization which is a an umbrella um, organization which assists the island um members in their anti-doping activities and certainly australia and new zealand have supported arado um, for many, many years, and again, money at times, people at other times, but certainly our collateral, our training, our education, um, we do offer it up and hope to help them, um, help their athletes. Does it frustrate you at times because both New Zealand and Australia are very stringent in anti-doping? Other countries aren't there yet? Look, I had a quote from a few years ago, pre-Gold uh, Coast Com Games, I think, where you know, the question was asked, why do we? Why would we um, in Oceania have an A-grade anti-doping program if there are countries out there with a B, C or heaven help us, a D or an E-grade anti-doping program? Um, I've been asked something similar by the athletes in New Zealand who say, why do you test me so much? And we test people so much because they're really successful. And I want to go and show the world that our Kiwi athletes are clean so no one has any doubt. Um, and I will make no apologies for testing our athletes or having an A-grade program. And I know David Sharp says the same in Australia. We believe so strongly in our ethics in Australia and New Zealand are so strong that this um, the high level of integrity in anti-doping programs, the quality will continue doing that. So we're not going to compromise on that no matter what anybody else is doing. But the, um, the promise I make our, my athletes in New Zealand is that we'll go to the rest of the world and demand that they do the same. So if we see competing nations who do not have a good anti-doping program, we'll either help them get it better or we'll actually demand publicly that they improve and do things differently because we need everybody to lift their game. If everybody lifts their game, New Zealand athletes are better supported and have cleaner competition. Same for Australian athletes and same for every athlete. Is your testing based on, on random or intelligence-based? How, how do you do your testing? Oh, I think the days of truly random testing 
pause as I say this to think about it. I think the days of truly random testing are behind us. And we certainly look back um, before my time, let's go back 10 years, um, and you might be pulling numbers out of a hat as to which player on a, on a team was going to get tested. We've stopped doing that. We've got enough intelligence on um, players, on athletes, to actually choose who we test. And, and that's really not to say that everyone we test we think is a doper. That intelligence might say that uh, John Smith hasn't ever been tested before. So we're actually going to give him his first test. And that's our intelligence he's chosen because he's never been tested before. Or we say that Mike's actually not been tested for three years, so he's not been tested for a long time. And um, also come back from an injury or has got some really good results. Um, so there's a variety of reasons. And it doesn't necessarily mean we think anyone's a doper, but we'll have a reason for testing them most of the time. Nick, at the Global Education Conference, you were quite moved by... You're talking there about education, but Cassie Feen, who we've got in this podcast as well, her story about being an athlete who tested positive was banned and the impact that it had on her life. But I guess her quest at the moment is to educate as many athletes as possible about the dangers of supplements. What moved you so much about Cassie Feen's story? Goodness me, I mean, I saw, I saw that yesterday morning, was it? And I am still uh, moved by it now. It was... It was um, really resonated. You've got an athlete. It is so raw for her, um, and it could be anybody. She, um, you know, top student, motivated to run with a relationship with her father. Um, there are so many factors in there, and of everyone who should be clean, and in her case was clean, um, up until the point she took a supplement, which she didn't know about. It contained hygienamine, which is a term which many athletes won't have heard of, but I know immediately it's a prohibited substance. But it didn't say hygienamine on the label. It said something different. And I wouldn't have checked, I wouldn't have known that substance um, at all. So it's a case of checking it all on, on Global Dro. Um, but, but it's life-changing. It has been life-changing for her. And the fact that she's now willing to share it is just quite amazing. We can talk to athletes um, in New Zealand, and we do, and educate them on supplements and the dangers and what they need to do and how they check things. Um, but if I tell them that, they may listen to me. But if we can get people like Cassie over to New Zealand to come and talk to the athletes directly, um, they will relate to her quite differently. And I think this will be, it can, we can make fundamental change um, with people like her. Um, her bravery and her openness to doing this is just amazing. So um, I can't wait to get her over to New Zealand. So you're going to use her in New Zealand, eh? To, to 100%. Educate, yeah, okay. 100%. If we can bring her over just to tell her story. Okay. She talks about the mental health aspect of it too and the fact that it virtually crushed her and she's still dealing with it to this day and I think sometimes we forget about that don't we we sort of look at a positive test and think okay that athlete's banned move on look the well-being side certainly um in New Zealand athlete well-being has been a hot topic for, for quite some time and we've had some um some darker stories in the last few years um and so well-being's really big for us from an anti-doping perspective and um, we do two things for our athletes um, in particular when we tell them about an ADRV. And, and the first is we provide them with a, um, a fund so they can get legal advice. So when they first told they're actually looking at a positive test, they can actually take some proper legal advice to help them get through the process. But perhaps the more important bit before that, we're just now beginning to talk to athletes about their well-being and providing them support from a psych perspective um, and providing them with funding so they can actually go and get proper psych and support if they need it. Their well-being is fundamental. If you're a professional athlete, you are facing losing your income for which your family rely on. If you're Cassie and the likes of her, it's, it's, your, it's your person, it's you, it's your character um, and fundamentally changed. Um, it must come down like a stone um, and to protect them and give them support is just really important. So we are, we are in a blunt area of life where we've got a code which says to an athlete if you take something you're responsible for whatever's in your body um, so we try to deal with people with people as gently as we can um, in that context apart from australia um, are there other countries that you you're working in close partnership with that have a similar identical feel as New Zealand does? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question. I was um, talking with the chief executive of the Azerbaijani um, National Anti-Doping Organisation quite recently, um, Shafak, and Shafak was telling me um, about her country and her organisation, and what we discovered pretty quickly was that New Zealand and Azerbaijan have got, we've got similar budgets, we've got a similar headcount in terms of anti-doping, we're doing the similar number of tests. The similarities between the countries were just remarkable, and we, we certainly tried to share with um, Shafak's team. But more widely, um, we've got 
collaborators all over the place mm. um, through the Pacific, as I say, but we tend to try and support them more than say receive back. But the Americans and the Canadians, the Norwegians, the Swedes, and the Swiss, the Irish, the Brits, um, Kenya recently, all over. You know, we, we this is a team game, anti-doping, um, and we are stronger if we work together. And so people are really keen to help each other. And of course, New Zealand is going a similar way that Sport Integrity Australia has already gone in terms of a wider remit to take in broader integrity issues, not just anti-doping, but anti-doping being a, a very central part of it. Correct. So um, at some time in early 2024, there will be a new entity in New Zealand called, which is responsible for all of integrity in sport. Um, you guys in Australia, you, you know, Sport Integrity Australia has been set up um, now for two, two and a half years, I think. Um, so you're ahead of us, but you know, we know that we are probably a bit better at sport and probably a bit more in higher integrity in sport, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we could afford to be slightly behind. Better at rugby. Yeah. Um, uh, but 2024, that will be happening and that will be the full remit. I mean, you're right, Tim, it'll be anti-doping won't stop. Anti-doping will continue. Um, but in the same way that ASADA became Sport Integrity Australia, Drug Free Sport New Zealand will be rolled into a new entity. The anti-doping will continue. It'll pick up match manipulation or competition manipulation, well-being, child welfare, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Do you see, like, obviously anti-doping is still going to be very important, but as you move into that broader in integrity framework, it's important not to take your eye off the ball and anti-doping is so important and, and education is so important as well. Oh, goodness me, you've, you've hit two, um, two topics quite close to my heart. and I can only guess at what the future holds, but anti-doping is so important that it must never be dropped. Mm. We can't... We can't take our eye off the ball on the anti-doping side but equally the rest of integrity is also important so you can't be dominated by anti-doping there's going to have to be some balance in there mm. and the answer is the one you've already touched on and that's education the education applies across the entire thing we've got um we've got some awesome people designing our education for us and delivering it um and we're doing that anti-doping in the future that will be across all areas of integrity but education giving our athletes knowledge to compete cleanly, giving athletes knowledge to protect them from manipulation or wellbeing threats. Um, it's all about supporting them and education is just the be all and end all. Is there a difference? You've got a population of four and a half million compared to Australia's 20 plus million. Is there a difference there in that you're able to keep a closer eye on, on athletes in your country because it is such a smaller population? You mentioned a moment ago you rely heavy, heavily on intelligence. I'd imagine that it would be hard in New Zealand, harder in New Zealand than it would be in far bigger populations. Look, it's an interesting one. We know that 90% um, of our athletes are typically domiciled in two areas, one being Auckland, um, the biggest city in New Zealand, um, and one being in and around Cambridge in the Waikato, which is uh, a high-performance hub. And that's 90% of our best athletes. Once you take away team sports because they're typically in provinces around the country so they're brought together in, in in two areas i think because of the size of the country and our population we actually find access um probably easier than others and i remember that we had our first athlete forum um in 2018 and we brought together 50 high performance athletes and sat them in a room and told them um you know, better work stories other bits of anti-doping which they hadn't heard before and, and said to them, this is Q&A, this is your chance to ask me as a chief executive anything you want. And they made it clear they didn't like the, the whereabouts program, for instance, and they asked the questions about how many times they're tested. Um, but we were asked after the event, how did you pull together such a high-quality group of high-performance athletes in the same place at the same time? Um, and the answer is we rang them up. We rang up a handful of them and said, bring the rest of the guys. Um, and it was really as easy as that because they were motivated to want to learn more and, and motivated to come and ask questions and the opportunity. Um, and I think because we're a smaller population, a couple of phone calls got 50 cracking athletes in a room together. So, so you feel as though you, feel as though you almost crack that clean, fair sport ethos? They're interested to know. They're really interested to hear and they want to know more. Um, it's interesting some of the stories um, we've heard recently – um, and I'm thinking of athletes who have appeared on on, on, on tape, you know, on, on, on video, actually talking about their experiences of accidental doping, if if, if there is such a thing, um, contaminated supplements through to uh, theatre sports and deliberate dopers. Um, athletes are aware there's a risk there, and we need to keep reminding them that there's a risk. We give them the opportunities to do it properly and do it well, 
but they need to remind us there's a risk there and that's what they now are getting more interested in hearing and reminders about how it could go wrong because none of us want that to happen. Yeah. Just as a final question on yourself, obviously do you sort of see it as a personal goal for you in terms of educating as many athletes oh. as possible? Do you, do you take it personally and not just sort of, oh, this is a... This is what we've got to do. No, Tim, I, I, you know, I, my, I've got a long professional history in the integrity space, having come through fraud and corruption investigations um, and now into sport and anti-doping. Um, like many of us, a huge sports fan and the idea of competing cleanly, strongly and as hard as you possibly can. And don't get me wrong, I'll be as competitive as the next person and possibly better at being competitive than the next person. Um, but it's all about how you win. Um, it's that cleanliness. I don't mind losing if the other person is better than me. But if I think they're cheating, that's a personal affront. Um, and so educating athletes, giving them the chance to prove they're clean and to go into the world stage and actually show who is the best. And when the Kiwis bring home gold medals, the Korean Commonwealth Games, massive tally of gold medals, you know, we're so proud of it because we know it's clean, we know it was earned, and we know we're good. Good on you. Uh, thanks very much for joining us on Onside, Nick. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. And now for our segment from Left Field, where we answer a question from the public. G'day, I'm Riley, athlete educator with Sport Integrity Australia. Today's from Left Field question is, are para-athletes subject to the same anti-doping rules? Absolutely yes, all athletes and support personnel are subject to the same anti-doping rules. For more information on those rules, head to our website. Thanks for listening to Onside. We'll be back with another episode shortly. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au or check out our Clean Sport app.